Hi, welcome back to Enzyme Function and Kinetics. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, so specifically in this video, we're going to talk about a type of inhibition called suicide inhibition. And suicide inhibition also has another name. It's called irreversible inhibition. All right, there's other types of inhibition that we're going to talk about in some of the uh, next videos. Those are reversible types of inhibition, which just means that an inhibitor can bind to an enzyme at a particular part, and then it can dissociate. And that's why it's reversible. It's reversible binding, and then there's dissociation. When you have irreversible inhibition, this is where you have some drug, some molecule, it doesn't have to be a drug, it could be a poison, all right? And this molecule, whatever it happens to be, is going to get into the active site, usually, of the enzyme. That's the most common place. And it's going to covalently attach itself somehow to one of the critical residues in the active site, okay? And when I say a critical residue, what I mean is an amino acid residue, usually, that is vital for the mechanism of the enzyme. Okay, so generally when you have suicide inhibitors or irreversible inhibitors, um, usually you want to know what the mechanism of the enzyme is because oftentimes you need to know which amino acid residues are important so that you can covalently modify it if, if that's what you desire. Okay. Another name for this type of inhibition is covalent inhibition because generally you're covalently adding some molecule onto one of the residues and that's going to kill the enzyme. So the whole point of irreversible inhibition is because it's irreversible, it covalently and permanently kills that enzyme to where it has no function for the rest of its existence, basically. All right, so to give an example of how this works, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to first look at part of the mechanism of one enzyme that's really important. Um, this is called thymidylate synthase. This is where we're going to normally take this molecule right here, which is actually deoxyUMP. This is how you convert deoxyUMP ultimately through a few extra steps to deoxyTMP. This is actually how you turn uracil ultimately into thymine for DNA synthesis. And there's some other things that happen. So we're going to look at deoxyUMP. This R group is the, um, is the deoxyribose ultimately. Okay, And then down here, this is a slightly different molecule. Notice that in deoxyUMP, this atom right here is a hydrogen. That's going to be really important here. It's a fluoride. So what they did is they synthesized a molecule that looks exactly like uracil, except they replaced that hydrogen with a fluoride. And so this part of the molecule up here, if you neglect the R group, this is 5-fluorouracil. Okay, so this is called deoxy, deoxy 5-fluorouMP. Okay, so it's still DUMP, except it has a 5-fluoro group. And we'll see how that plays a role. So let's look at the, the real mechanism, at least the, the really important parts. All right. So in the mechanism, and it's going to be the same for down here, there's this critical cysteine residue that is going to attack this carbon right here. That's going to cause these pi electrons to attack this thing up here, putting those pi electrons onto the nitrogen. This thing up here, this is actually a folate. It's a derivative of folate. Um, in fact, I believe it is... N5, N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate, but that's not really important. What that essentially does, as you can hopefully see in this uh, next step, so this critical cysteine residue, which is actually part of the enzyme, is going to attack this carbon right here. That's going to force these pi electrons to attack this carbon, forcing these electrons under the nitrogen. If you're wondering, it's not really that important. This is a type of folate. It's a, co it's a coenzyme used by the, or you could, in some cases you can consider, consider it a substrate, but in any case, it's actually N5, N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate. That's not important. So hopefully what you can see is that this step not only covalently attaches the enzyme to the uracil moiety, but it also attaches the uracil to the folate. Okay, so we have a covalent intermediate already right here. Now this is where the, the this is the really important step that was used to determine what drug to make to stall this enzyme. There's a base in the active site right here, and what it's actually able to do is it's going to take this proton and it's going to force this movement right here. Okay. Now, the mechanism is not really so much important, but th there is one step that is important. The only way this is able to proceed is if this atom is a hydrogen. Okay, bases 
only pick off hydrogens. They don't pick off anything else, okay? They're not gonna pick off a carbon, they're not gonna pick off an oxygen, and certainly not a fluorine. So this atom has to be a hydrogen, and under normal biological conditions, your body can make this molecule, so it's gonna put a hydrogen there. So there's gonna be a hydrogen there for this step to ultimately continue, and then assuming this is DUMP, it's just gonna be a number of other mechanistic steps, and you're gonna get deoxy-TMP, and that can be converted to thymine for DNA synthesis. All right, so this is the only step we're gonna look at in really importance. Now, this was DUMP, this is the normal substrate of the molecule. And this is actually the ingenious of the design of this particular drug. They made deoxy-5-fluoro-UMP, and really it's made as 5-fluorouracil, but it's converted in the body to this. So this is the active ingredient, all right? They knew the mechanism prior to making this drug. They knew that this base had to pick off this proton right here, this hydrogen. So what they did is they replaced the hydrogen here with a fluorine, okay? Now, one thing that's kind of important in drug synthesis is from the body's perspective, yes, you could argue fluorine is bigger than hydrogen, but really and truly, fluorine behaves a lot like hydrogen. It's about the same size in all reality, um, it does add some electronic effects, but overall, fluorine is a good substitute for hydrogen. And this is how it's used in this case. So just like, in, up, just like up here, the cysteine attacks this carbon, this pi bond attacks this carbon, and you get the same mechanism overall. Okay? You still have the sulfur here of the cysteine attached to the uracil, and then the uracil is attached to the folate derivative. All right? Here's the problem. Okay? Can a base actually pick off a fluorine? The answer is no, okay? Yes, um, ultimately we can say that the fluorine looks a lot like the hydrogen, but from an orbital perspective, fluorine has those p orbitals, hydrogen has the s orbital, and that's what is ultimately allowing the base to pick off the hydrogen. Here it's a fluorine, and so the base can't do anything. It can't pick off this fluorine, so at this point the enzyme is stalled. And also because the cysteine residue is a covalently attached to the uracil, uracil moiety, it's not going to actually reverse itself. It's actually stuck like this. Okay? The only way this can proceed is if this atom is a hydrogen, but it's not. It's a fluorine. So what you've effectively done with this is you have killed the enzyme. Okay? The enzyme is stalled. It can't proceed past this because the, it would have to be a hydrogen here for the base to abstract it. Bases can't abstract fluorines. Okay, so what do we see? We see that the enzyme right here is covalently attached to this thing, and so that's covalent modification, or covalent inhibition, suicide inhibition, and it's irreversible. And since this enzyme, thymidylate synthase, is used to uh, synthesize um, nucleotides like deoxy-TMP, which is used to make thymine, there's no longer any ability to do DNA replication because you don't have any Ts to add to your um, you know, growing DNA chain with uh, DNA replication. So any cell that, you know, has to replicate a lot can't replicate. And that's perfect because cancer cells tend to want to replicate a lot. So actually this drug, 5-fluorouracil, which gets converted to deoxy-5-fluorouMP, this is an anti-cancer drug. It's one of the first that was made, and it's actually still used today because it's so effective. All right? And it all came from knowing the mechanism of this enzyme. They knew that you had to abstract this hydrogen to complete the mechanism, so they stuck a fluorine right there. All right? And so it's just kind of an ingenious way to um, go about killing an enzyme. Um, and remember, this is a covalent type of inhibition. Okay? It's not reversible. It's irreversible. All right? So hopefully seeing this gave you kind of an idea of what a suicide inhibitor does. Okay? There's not really a whole lot to quantify here. We're not going to go into that, but we are going to look at in the next few videos competitive, uncompetitive, and mixed inhibition, and we are going to quantify those. All right? So make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Join us in the next few videos where we go over other types of inhibition.